Zack Snyder, have I ever told you the definition of insanity? What is up, everybody? Welcome to my review of Rebel Moon Part 1, A Child of Fire. This is a part one of an announced two-part. I'm sure there might even be a three. There's going to be some spinoffs, but a new universe of films that is from the mind of Zack Snyder and released exclusively on Netflix. So a little bit of history about this movie. Apparently like 12, 13 years ago, Zack Snyder had this idea for a more adult R-rated take on Star Wars and he actually pitched it to Lucasfilm. They passed on it. We obviously never saw that come to fruition nor have we seen any adult R-rated take on Star Wars come to fruition. And so his ideas for this movie more or less were shelved until very recently where Netflix brought him in after the whole release the Snyder Cut madness with WB. He released Army of the Dead on Netflix, a limited theatrical run, and now he is very much uh, in a constant partnership with Netflix to where seemingly, for those of us that are Snyder fans, he's going to be able to make whatever he wants and have his vision untainted. Or so we thought. Now, I have been looking forward to the release of this film. Everything that I've heard about it, an R-rated, more adult take on Star Wars, very much my thing. I am a casual fan of Star Wars, but I, I like the darker edge stuff. So Snyder's take on that type of world more likely is going to be something I enjoy. The fact that uh, he was going to be able to build out this new universe that we're going to see in multiple films. They've already announced spinoffs. They have a lot of faith in this property. That gave me a lot of excitement. All of that came to a bit of a screeching halt a few months ago when we started to get these reports and interviews from Zack Snyder, more or less saying that, yet again, we are going to get a watered down, cut down version of this movie first, and then months later we'll get the true version of the movie. It's over, enough! Enough! So the one that you are able to watch right now on Netflix is the two hour and 15, two hour and 20 minute cut that is PG-13 that's had all of the extreme violence and gore and maybe even language cut out of it and a number of story and character elements cut out of it. And then about five or six months from now, a few months before we get part two, we're gonna get the director's cut released on Netflix with all of that shit put back in it. And let's just say when we get to the later part of this review, we're going to unpack that a bit. Do you realize what you've done? So as somebody who is a Zack Snyder fan, as somebody who likes every single one of his movies aside from Sucker Punch, as somebody who has been excited for this, but also somebody who knows very much the, the interworkings of what has happened and seeing the early reviews very much saying that that cripples this take of the movie, this cut of the film, what did I think of it? Did I like it? Am I sold on Rebel Moon? Do I want to see more? But really quick before we dive into the insanity of Rebel Moon, if you want to watch the new Zack Snyder film in the most energized and extreme way possible, check out the sponsor of today's video, G Fuel. Whether it's a regular day of the week or during this dreaded, stressful holiday season, every single one of us knows what it's like to be dragging through the end of a day and desperately need an energy boost. I'm taking a nap! You want to take a nap? I'm taking a nap here. Or even worse, when you struggle through all of that, get everything that you need to get done throughout the day to sit home and cuddle up with a nice video game just to find out that you are absolutely depleted. And even if you persevere through all of that, you have the dreaded struggle of finding something that is not absolutely terrible for your body while also tasting good. And that's why today I'm excited to partner with G Fuel, the official energy drink of eSports and gaming. They're available in a variety of ready to drink cans as well as powdered energy tubs. But the best part is there are little to no calories and zero sugar, which means zero dreaded crash by the end of the day. You heard me right. That's clean, natural energy in a variety of flavors. Are you a Mega Man fan? Then check out the Blue Bomber slushy flavor, which genuinely tastes like a blue slushy. Or if Sonic is more your speed, check out the delicious peach red. Rings. And to celebrate the release of Zack Snyder's Rebel Moon, G Fuel has collaborated with Walmart to bring you a limited edition Imperium Tonic Collector's Box, which includes an exclusive Rebel Moon Shaker Cup as well as the Imperium Tonic Energy Tub, which comes in a berry kiwi watermelon flavor. So head over to GFuel.com and use my discount code CODY20 to save 20% off of your order. That's 20% off by using the code CODY20 at GFuel.com. And thank you to G Fuel for partnering with me on today's sponsorship. Starting off with the positives, 
I am sold on this world. I do want to see more. I do have interest to check out the director's cut. I do have interest to check out the part two. I do have interest to see what other spinoffs or what other parts of this story they have in store for us. This is a world that I definitely want to spend more time in. I enjoy the characters. I enjoy, you know, it's very similar to Star Wars, and we'll get more into that later, but it is a little bit more of an edgier version of that. And I just like a lot of the, the mythos and the lore and some of the history that they just dabble in into this. It's enough to wet my beak and make me say, okay, now let's explore all of that further. Sophia Batella is your lead of this movie and she's somebody that I have always been very curious about. You know, we saw her in some side roles where she was more so used for her physicality. She is a dancer, so we saw her in Kingsman. Uh, we saw her in what was seemingly going to be kind of her on-ramp to be a little bit more A-list, which was Tom Cruise's The Mummy. We all know how that worked out, but she's somebody that I've always felt, even with Atomic Blonde, that was another one that she was in that she was good. I've always felt she had a lot of potential, and this is the first time that we have seen her lead a movie and lead a story, and I think she does a damn good job. I think she's a good actress. I think that she's badass. I liked her character. She's really the only character in the movie that we really get to know a lot about and dive into and kind of have a bit of an arc with her. And so I'm invested very much in seeing where that goes. There's a number of action sequences in this movie that focus on her physicality, both in a physical sense, as well as like her shooting and her mobility. And she's a badass character. And what I like about her is that she's a very complicated hero, which I tend to like more than your very straight laced, more stock hero to where she has this nobility about her. She has this sense of right and wrong. She has this sense of justice that she wants to strive for in this story. But we also get to learn little bits about her throughout the movie that paint her in a light to where she has definitely done some wrong in her past and she has committed sins and she has done things that have molded her into this person that now very much, much wants to fight against what she used to put into the world. And I just think that's a really interesting dynamic for a lead character. This is a Zack Snyder film, so visually I think it's very strong. Now that's one thing that whether you dislike Zack Snyder as a filmmaker or not, you can never take away from him. He is a very visually strong filmmaker. The way that he brings this world to life, the way that he has the different characters look, the way that he utilizes CGI and special effects, the color palette that he uses, the, the visuals that he decides to focus on in certain points of the story. I, I really enjoy what he brings as a filmmaker from that standpoint. You know, he might have some faults in the storytelling department once in a while, but that's one thing that he always brings a really nice edge to with his films, and I think Rebel Moon is one of his strongest examples of that so far. I also really like the score to this movie. I believe it was by Junkie XL. It's very much an orchestral score, but there's a, like a acoustic guitar flavor in there that very much brings that Western edge that I liked for Star Wars very much being like a space fantasy. And this is very much that as well. This has much more of a Western edge to it. And I think that's what makes it stand out a bit. And I like that, I prefer that. So the score's job for me as a movie fan is to reinforce and enhance everything that I'm seeing visually on screen very much succeeds in that in this movie. Moving on to The Mixed, very similar to The Creator, a movie from earlier on this year, this movie very much wears all of its influences on its sleeve. It very much is, is blatant and does not hide whatsoever the things that it is, is nabbing certain elements for and doing a, a newer version of. I mean, you've got Star Wars is the most obvious one. We've talked about that at least seven times in this video alone. And it's to the point where you actually have the movie open up with space and stars. The first thing that comes into view is this giant ship, only instead of an opening text crawl, you get an opening monologue by Anthony Hopkins. There's a segment of the movie where it's basically them walking into Moss easily to find the, the scoundrel, the pilot. I mean, there's segments of the movie where it's like, this is really fucking Star Wars. And some people are gonna love that, some people are gonna hate that. I liked it, but I like a little bit more originality in there. And even on a storytelling front, you have Seven Samurai, you have The Magnificent Seven, which is very much just a version of Seven Samurai. And even more so than those two, there was a lot of very direct flavor in the storytelling that reminded me of A Bug's Life, which again, I know it, it harkens back to some of those older movies that I just referenced, but 
when the movie starts off and your main origin of conflict here is that you have the farmer characters and then you have the bad guys show up and say, yeah, I want a plate of grain waiting for me when I get back. 10 weeks from now, we're coming back and we're taking all your grain and we're gonna fuck you up if you don't do it. And then the main character's like, I gotta go off and find the warriors. Bugs life. Where's my food? And so I say all of that to kind of come to the same conclusion that I did with the creator, which is that I, I very much appreciate when a filmmaker can hone in a lot of their influences and can take things of the past and mold it into their own thing, which Zack Snyder has such a distinct style that it's very easy for him to do a Snyderfied version of whatever he's taken influence from. But there might be a few too many direct references to those things of the past that makes this feel like it lacks originality a bit. And now moving on to the negatives. One thing that a lot of people give Snyder shit for is his use of slow-mo. More times than not, I think that his use of it is actually fine and it's a, it's a cool element, 300 probably being the best example of that. In this movie, I feel like 80% of the time that he uses it, it was for no reason whatsoever. I mean, you'll have a character running and then it'll slow down for like five seconds and then it goes back to full speed and you'll have a character shooting and then it'll slow down for one bullet to go out slow motion and then it'll go back to, to regular speed. There's some moments in fight scenes and in bigger scenes where you're like, okay, slowing down, actually it gives you like a cool little moment to breathe and check out everything that's going on in a wide shot. A lot of other times it just kind of feels like he did it because he's expected to. This movie absolutely has a part one problem, which is something that has kind of become a term that we use more times than not in movie discussion over the past two years to where we've had so many part ones that don't really feel like they resolve any kind of an isolated story to merit that story being on its own. And this is very much one of those films to where there's so many things that are set up and so many things that are, you know, in, ignited and started to be paid off that we're not going to see the payoff until part two. And that would be fine if there was even just like a really satisfying story being told here that you come to a natural climax or conclusion by the end of it that feels like, okay, we have resolved all of this and there's a couple of dangling things that are going to be explored and extrapolated for whatever conflict we explore in part two. That's not the way that this is. You've got like 17 things that are started and like two are resolved very quickly and suddenly by the end of this film. And so it almost feels like you're watching the pilot to a TV show, but episode two doesn't come out for like nine months. And the way that we experience storytelling in a TV format is very different in a movie format to where mentally you have an expectation when you watch TV that when there's more episodes left in a season, we're not gonna feel resolved until the end of that. And when there's more seasons to come, we're not gonna feel even completely whole by the end of this season because there's gonna be threads that we're gonna have to explore in the next season. In a movie, whether it's titled part one or not, you expect a complete experience, you expect a complete story, you expect a certain amount of closure and satisfaction by the time that the credits roll, and I think they failed here with that. But the biggest issue with this movie, which I already alluded to, which I kind of expected to be something that was gonna be a big issue from the moment that I started to hear them talk about this months ago, is that this is not the complete version of this film. And I am at the point now where even as a Snyder fan and somebody that roots for him, I'm fucking tired of having to watch a two hour trailer for the true movie that comes out months later. I'm tired of this. We had it with Batman v Superman, we had it with Justice League, and now we have it again. And it's just like, whoever made this decision, you're an ass. I don't, I still, I've sifted through interviews, I have watched video clips, and I can't completely get a read on whether or not this was a corporate decision by Netflix to manufacture some sort of a Snyder cut response to the next cut of their movie. Get down on your knees and tell me you love me. I, I love you! you or if this was Zack Snyder trying to deliver what he needs to do to satisfy a studio, but at the same time holding back his true vision for something else, maybe it was both of them, I really don't know. If it was Netflix's decision, it's yet another dumb, idiotic decision that Netflix has made in a long running list of stupid and competent decisions. And if it was Zack Snyder's decision, shame on you because with all of the bullshit and the drama and the backlash and the negativity that's still is palpable 
from the situation that happened with the Justice League Snyder Cut, if you are blatantly doing that on purpose again, you learned nothing from your own drama. And it pisses me off even more that this is a straight to streaming movie. I would at least understand from a business side of things if this was gonna be a theatrical release, why they wouldn't want a three hour cut, why they wouldn't want a rated R cut when shorter movies can play on more screens and PG-13 movies can get more people in the seats. I would at least understand that. But it's on fucking Netflix, so none of that matters. You are made of Stupid. And I wondered when I click play, I'm like, okay, am I actually going to be looking for parts of this movie that feels like there's something missing because I'm walking in knowing there's another cut? And if I watch this not knowing that, would I see it as blatantly? And I can tell you definitively, even if I never heard anything about an upcoming director's cut of this film, it is so blatantly obvious that this was shot to be rated R and this was shot to be about 45 minutes minimum longer than what take we are seeing right now that it's infuriating. The entire second act of this movie, which is well over an hour of the film where they're assembling the team where Sofia Batella has gone off and she's trying to get the pilots and get all these different people with these distinctive skills to round up the warriors to take on the villain that we were introduced to in the first act. There is so much that is obviously cut out of the storytelling in that second act that the second act nearly ruins the film. First act, where we get introduced to this world, we get introduced to Sofia Vitella, we get introduced to the villain, and the villain comes down and you know plants their feet in the sand and says, you're gonna get us this grain or we're gonna fuck you up. When all of that is being set up, I thought it was great. When you get to the last act of the film, which starts incredibly suddenly, you don't even realize you're entering the third act until you're like halfway through the third act. So rushed, but when you get to the third act and all of a sudden the action's kicking off and it's like, oh shit, we're doing this. That was a very exciting part of the film. The entire hour or more in the middle where we're just going through exposition and getting introduced to these characters and these different planets and we're assembling the team. It is so repetitive. It is so monotonous. It is so exposition heavy that I struggled to get through that middle hour. And as much as I wanted to get introduced to these badass characters, there's so much cut out of their character development that it's, it's just a wash, rinse, repeat experience of we're gonna land on this planet, we're gonna get introduced to this person who's potentially gonna be part of our team while they're in the middle of some kind of a conflict or action sequence. We're gonna induct them onto our team, we're gonna get back on the ship and go to the next place. And now we have one additional person that's going to stand there on the next planet and watch this next potential member of the team in the middle of an action sequence before we go talk to them, recruit them, and then go to the next planet. And there's no in-between moments on the ship where we get some development of relationships or we learn a little bit more about these characters. All we learn about the majority of the cast of this movie is one distinctive skill that they have that makes them stand out amongst the pack, and that is their entire character development. Like, Jamon Hansu's character, the whole movie, he's made out to be like this big, bad motherfucker that we have to go get, and he's got like this, this messed up past that very much ties to the villain, and you know, there's, this is a big deal that we go get this guy. I can't tell you jack shit about why that guy is so badass other than the fact that he's Jamon Hansu and he looks like a monster. Even some reveals that happen by the third act in regards to who people actually are don't really feel like they have any weight because we haven't spent any time learning about the false version of that character. So when there's information given to us that's supposed to change what we knew before, well, we didn't know shit before, so nothing gets changed. And beyond the storytelling, it is so obvious in the action sequences that this movie was shot to be much bloodier and much more violent because as cool as the action sequences are in this cut of the film, they are very quickly cut away whenever any sort of potential violence happens. Like there's the action sequence that's been very heavily promoted in the trailers where Sofia Batella whoops a bunch of dudes ass in a barn with like an ax and a gun. Every time that ax came into play, it would just cut away and you would just hear what happened. When I know it was shot with a blood spurt or a decapitation or a penetration or something, and that is also so frustrating. Like there's very important kills that happen where significant character meets a grisly end that we don't get to see. It just suggests what's happening because gotta be PG-13, gotta support the kitties even though it's on fucking Netflix. And so at the end of the day, this is a very complicated movie to try and review because did I enjoy it 
Overall, yes, I did, but I enjoyed it in the way that I enjoy a really badass trailer to a movie that I'm interested in checking out when it finally comes out. And that's essentially what this movie feels like when you get to the end of it. It was a two hour and 15 minute trailer for the actual film that we'll see at some point in 2024. And I just fucking despise that we are doing that. No matter whose decision it was to do that, I despise the fact that they did that. So if you're a Snyder fan, are you going to like this? Even this cut of the movie? Most of them will. If you're not a Snyder fan, are you gonna like this? I think it's gonna be a bit of a toss up. I think the Star Wars edge is gonna bring some people on that maybe didn't care for his other stuff. I think there's other people that distinctly do not like that Zack Snyder's style and this is not different enough to win those people over. But do I recommend you watch this? There's a part of me that actually wants this cut of the movie to bomb on Netflix and then the true cut of the movie to succeed wildly with numbers so that they don't do this again when we get part two or part three, or however many Rebel Moon things that we get on Netflix. I don't want them to learn the wrong lessons by this movie's success and this movie's numbers because I don't know a single person who was looking forward to this movie that found out that there's the true Zack Snyder cut that they're just holding back for a few months from now that was happy about that decision. And so many people are gonna see this cut of the movie and are gonna be turned off from watching anything else in Rebel Moon because of how hacked up this cut is. And it's gonna wildly outweigh the number of people that see this, that have frustrations with that, but are willing to watch the three hour cut in a few months and are willing to forgive the issues of this movie because eventually they get what they want. Though you're gonna turn off more people than you win over. And so just the absolute stupidity and ridiculousness of that decision is just unfortunately gonna paint my thoughts of this film, no matter how much I enjoyed it or not. Well, that's it for this one, guys. If you enjoyed that, please click over here for all of my 2023 new release reviews. I'm also going to put my most recent Zack Snyder ranking. I'm not gonna do another one this weekend. I'll do another one whenever we get part two of this film and we see the actual cut of this first film. But check that out if you want to, like or share, and hit that subscribe button so you don't miss all that in the future. And as always, remember, opinions are like assholes, but that doesn't mean you have to be.